grace, peace, and mercy are yours. And God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and dear friends. How good are you at following instructions? Or maybe the question should be, do you like following instructions? Now, I suppose some of you have already bought some Christmas gifts, and maybe on the outside of the box it says, some assembly required. And if you have something like that, and maybe you've already put it together to put under the Christmas tree, do you actually follow those instruction manuals that they give? Or do you set them aside? Or maybe you're like me, you've done it so many times that you say, you know what, I don't need the instructions this time. That is, until you finish that piece and you're left with a bolt or a nut, and you're not sure where it goes. And that bolt or that nut could be the difference between that nice brand new TV stand that you bought, having your TV crash to the floor, or the bike that you built fall apart in the driveway. I think if you're like me, sometimes it's hard to follow instructions, especially as given, when you think you know a little bit more than the person who gave the instructions. <laughs> in our lesson today, the Apostle Paul gives us careful instruction from perhaps the best and perfect instruction manual that ever has been written. An instruction manual meant to bring people together in worship and praise of God. An instruction manual meant to give people hope for eternal life. This instruction manual is the Bible. For God shows us how to be Christians and how to, to lead a, a Christian life. We hear from that perfect instruction manual today from the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the congregation in Rome, Romans chapter 15. Paul writes, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and the encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Sing praises to him, all you people. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the Apostle Paul was faced with a, a huge challenge. He was writing to the church in Rome that had a, a very diverse mix of people. On the one hand, you had Jewish converts who had come from the Jewish faith, from all the years of, of regulations, of traditions, and some were superstitions and rumors. On the other hand, you had the Gentile converts, and they came in with the, the baggage, I guess you might say, of, of all the pagan religion and, and pagan practices and heathenism. And so they come at this at a, a very different viewpoint, and, and you can see with these very different groups of people that tension in this congregation would probably arise. Now right before our lesson, the Apostle Paul encourages these groups of Christians to, to come together to worship. And he reminds them that all along God wanted both the Jews and the Gentiles to be part of his family. Now he lays out this careful instruction from God's perfect instruction manual on, on how to live, how to work together, how to be united. And he goes back and he reminds these Christians that from the very beginning, as he wrote, everything was written in the past, was written to teach us. 
You see, the Bible is the perfect instruction manual to, to get us ready for our Savior. To, to let us know what our Savior is all about and, and what He has accomplished. And from the very beginning, God had talked about this promised Messiah, this Savior. Not just in the New Testament is where we get to know Jesus, but you can go back to the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through Malachi. Jesus is there. Unfortunately, I think many people had missed it. They didn't understand what the Messiah was coming to do. And unfortunately, many of the Jewish people had lost sight that this Messiah was coming for all people. The people of Israel thought they had an exclusive hold on the Messiah. Now the Apostle Paul is reminding them that all along, God wanted both Jews and Gentiles, people from Israel and Africa and Asia and Europe and the Americas and, and everywhere in between to come to their Heavenly Father to follow after His instructions. Because when you follow God's instructions, when you follow that perfect instruction manual, things are going to change for your life here and for the, one to each, for the one to come. And in that perfect instruction manual, you hear about Jesus. You hear about the unity that our Savior brings. That unity, first of all, that now we have between us and our Heavenly Father. The unity that Jesus brings because of that message of salvation that tells us our sins have been paid for. That we do have a new life to lead. Now I think all of us here would agree and we would all say we already know all that. We know what God has laid out in His Word. But yet I think we struggle, don't we? In following after that perfect instruction manual. Maybe we think that, that we know better or, or we've learned it enough that, that we can put it aside. And then there's the world and the devil that are constantly pulling on us to, to bring us back into sin and, and unbelief. And you all know the struggles you have. And perhaps for that reason, maybe some of us then are, are leading what you might say a, a double life. You have this one life that, that we lead here in church for a few hours. But then we go back into the world and we lead a completely different life. And we get ourselves into a, a whole heap of trouble when we do it, just like the Roman church was doing. And maybe we're leading this double life by, by doing things that we shouldn't when it comes to the internet, going to places that we don't think are going to affect anybody. Or maybe it's that we struggle with the materialism and the, the me-first attitudes of this life. Or maybe it's that we like to go around spreading rumors and, and gossip about fellow believers or, or our friends or our neighbors. And then people from the outside look at us and they say, wow, they're a bunch of hypocrites. It's clearly not the type of unity that the Apostle Paul was talking about, the type of unity we should have as brothers and sisters. Instead, listen again to what he says. He encourages us to come together so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we're going to come together, we, we really have to be on the same page of that instruction manual. We can't change what, what God has said. If we're going to really come together, we have to believe the same thing. And that's why I'm happy in our Lutheran church body that, that we stress Christian education, spending time in God's Word for our children, in Sunday school and, and schools, but also then for our adults, going through a Bible information class, teaching people exactly what the Bible says, telling them what it says as opposed to the rumors they might hear on the internet about Jesus. We spend time getting to know our Savior. Spending time in that perfect instruction manual. You see, what the Apostle Paul wants us to have is a, a faith based on what Christ says. Because even if, if 50 million people say something is true and it's false, it doesn't make it right, does it? It's still wrong. 
You see, we can't just agree to disagree. God's word is, is not negotiable. God's word should not be changed just because society has moved on. Paul reminds us that when we spend time in God's word, it should be in accord with what Jesus says. Only then can we have true unity. Because I think you know there's a lot of excuses out there for why we don't need to follow that instruction manual. Excuses people give for why they're doing certain things, why they're leading sinful lifestyles. And people even give the excuse, well, well, every path at the end ends up in heaven, so don't worry about it. But you see, I think that stubborn arrogance that proves right there that, that they don't even know what the Bible says. Christ calls on us to go back to His Word. And God's unity is not about minimizing differences, but it's about holding on to the truth. Now, I know that's not always going to be easy. And it's going to mean all of us coming together to do that. It means standing up for what's right. And it can't just be the pastor and the, the few unlucky guys who are appointed as elders each year that, that do that. It's up for all, all of us. We all have to say, you know what? I am willing to take a bullet for my church. In the sense that I'm willing to stand up when, when people are wrong. When the world is, is trying to go against us and, and what the Bible teaches. God's Word, God's perfect instruction manual is that important. And I know it's not always easy. I know it's not always pleasant or comfortable. To follow that word, that instruction manual. And yeah, sometimes people will get upset. They don't want to hear it. But you know, that's the devil. Because the devil sees a good thing. He sees a church like ours. He sees a church like the one in Rome. And, and he wants to break it apart by division. The devil doesn't want us spending time gathered together around God's word. The devil wants us to, to stop paying attention to God's instruction. But we're not going to let him do that, are we? We're not going to let the devil win. That's why we hold on. That's why we go back to God's perfect instruction manual so that we are united as brothers and sisters in Christ. United in a, a message that has changed our life eternally. In some ways, that's what the season of Advent is all about. Preparation, showing repentance. But it's all about putting our hope in the one who never fails. The one who came into this world and gave his life for us. The one who came into this world who, who makes heaven possible for us. The one who came into this world and made that unity between us and God again. So that now He is our Heavenly Father who is there to bless us, to shower His forgiveness upon us, to, to call us His children. That's what we have because of the cross. And now we stand there in the shadow of the cross knowing what our Savior has done, that He has accomplished on our behalf, and, and it changes everything. Now Christ calls on each and every one of us to go out there and show that same sort of love. To accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Now this doesn't mean that we just change everything about ourselves and pat ourselves on the back and say, it's okay to, to accept and, and tolerate sin. No, not at all. I mean, if we did that, I'm sure we could fill the church and, and we could have all the offerings in the world, but, but that's not what it's about. It's about making sure people hear the truth. Knowing what their Savior did for them. <coughs> knowing what the Savior did for each and every one of us here. That He has died for us. That He rose for us. That He has given us a new life. Our Savior did that for each of us. He's given us a, a new life here and especially we look forward to the one to come. So let's follow His instructions and we'll live. Live with Him forever. Amen.
And so may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.